Well, welcome to class number four. We're slowing our seminar way down, giving lots more detail, hopefully, and lots more information. In this uh, next this session and probably the next couple, we're going to talk about the age of the Earth. What I normally cover on my video number one B, what we call one B, the second seminar. How old is the Earth anyway? The Bible says in the beginning. Now, when was the beginning? Let's stop right there. How old is the Earth? It is an extremely important question. Christians are very much divided over this issue. Uh, how old is the earth? A hundred years ago, the division wasn't so bad, or maybe 200 years ago, everybody believed exactly what the Bible says, about 6,000 years for the age of the earth. But then when they began teaching the earth is billions of years old, Christians began to divide into two camps, those who stuck with what the Bible said and those who accepted what some of the scientists were saying and tried to make the Bible say the earth is billions of years old. And we'll get into more of that later with the compromised positions of the gap theory and the day-age theory. But it says uh, in, Matthew, in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus created all things. This is one of the verses that indicates Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. There are many other ways to indicate from the scripture that Jesus is God. Not just a God like Jehovah's Witnesses believe. He is God himself. Some of the same names that are given to God are given to Jesus. If you read the book of Revelation, for instance, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's an interesting passage, by the way. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Jesus was saying, I am like the A to Z. I'm like the alphabet. Now tell me, how many times can you write the letter A before you use it up and it's no longer available to be used? If I write the letter A down 10 billion times, does that diminish the letter A at all? It does nothing to it, does it? The Bible says in the book of Philippians that Jesus, or God will supply our needs according to his riches in glory. It doesn't say he will supply our needs out of his riches in glory. It's according to his riches in glory. There's a vast difference. See, if a billionaire gives you a dollar, he is one dollar poorer. Right? But if God gives you a dollar, he is not a dollar poorer. He does not give you out of his riches. He gives you according to his riches. And Jesus is saying, I am like the alphabet. I am the alpha and the omega. Use me all you want. You will never even diminish me at all. You're not using up God's mercy or God's grace. You're using according to. And his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace and his provision is according to his riches in glory, not out of his riches in glory. Some of the newer translations of the Bible have really scrambled that verse, and they say, out of his riches. Oh, major mistake. It's according to his riches. But there are all sorts of ways, and you can get off on a long tangent on the subject of how Jesus is God in the flesh. He's not just a God. He was God himself. But in Colossians, it says, Jesus created all things. Well, since Jesus created all things, and Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 19, have you not read... Now, he's talking about marriage and divorce in this passage, but this is a neat thought he threw in here. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? This is a verse you should know. We'll put this on a quiz for uh, what are one of the verses that indicates when the beginning was. Well, here it tells us the beginning was when God created them male and female. Another verse would be Mark 10, 6. That's a parallel passage, but basically saying the same thing. In the seminar notebook, you should find a section of uh, verses dealing with when the beginning was. I forgot to mark what page that's on here before the class tonight. Uh, but there's a whole section of verses. Here we go. Page uh, 13 and 14. At the bottom of page 13, at least in this current edition, we reprint our notebook frequently. You're watching the tape. may have something else because we reprint all the time. But uh, at the end of the Age of the Earth section, I just listed a bunch of verses about, you know, when was the beginning? And if you go through these verses, and you can do this on your own time, it's interesting to look at how many verses give us clues. For instance, it talks about uh, uh, all the blood of this generation, shall be, all the blood, uh, righteous blood shall be requ required of this generation. And then it says, from the blood of righteous Abel unto Zacharias the prophet. Wait a minute, was Abel the first one to die? According to the Bible, he was. And you can go through the scripture and find quite a few verses that indicate the beginning was indeed about 6,000 years ago not millions of years ago. Read the verses very carefully and you'll say, wow, that does tell us when the beginning was. For instance, Jesus said, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now, 
According to the evolution theory, the beginning was 20 billion years ago when we had a big bang. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. And then it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup. And the soup came alive about 3 billion years ago. So was the creation of male and female the beginning, according to the evolution theory? No. So those Christians who try to compromise their Bible with the evolution theory are going against this verse. They have to then come up with an excuse, and they'll say, well, this is, this is the beginning of people. Well, you, that's not what it says, is it? It just says, from the beginning of the creation, God made a male and female. And we know from Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 that death came by sin. I think one of the major differences between the Christians who try to say the Bible is literally true and is 6,000 years old, and the Christians who try to compromise that and say, no, the earth is billions of years old, one of the major differences is when did death come into the world and why do we have death in the world? Last week, I went to my mother's funeral up in Illinois. She was ready and anxious to die. She wanted out of here. She'd been suffering for a long time. Is death a friend or an enemy? The Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. According to the plain reading of Scripture, if you read Genesis carefully, uh, and read all through the Bible, there was no death until Adam disobeyed. Now, if those who teach the gap theory or the day-age theory or these other compromises to try to put millions of years into the Bible, they have to have death before sin. And yet the Bible says very clearly, death came by sin. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, it says, by man came death. It couldn't be much more clear than that. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Here we have an interesting passage where death and resurrection are put together. And we have the first man, the first Adam, and the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And there's all sorts of verses, and you can do a long study on this, how that Jesus Christ is called the second Adam. But if death came by man's sin, specifically by Adam's sin, then we should be able to calculate the age of the earth right from the Bible. And people have done this for centuries. You read through the Bible and they add up the dates, which we're about to show you here right now. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Adam was the first man. Also, if you read through Genesis, it's pretty obvious Adam was the first man. But this is a New Testament passage indicating this is indeed correct. Adam was the first man. You can also read through several genealogies. There's genealogies in Luke, chapter 3. There's a genealogy in Matthew, chapter 1, that tell us about the genealogies leading down to Jesus Christ. Now, some people will say there's a contradiction in the Bible with these two genealogies. You need to understand this. A little rabbit trail we can chase here. You go from Adam... And it traces down all the names, and you get to King David. David had 17 wives and a whole bunch of kids. Who knows how many kids he had? Doesn't matter. He had a lot of them. One of those kids was the father of the, the, the gene, the line of the genealogy that ended up with Mary. And I forget which, uh, I think it's Matthew that covers this genealogy from David's son, and I don't have it in front of me, it's either Nathan or one of the other ones, but it covers the genealogy to Mary. And it ends up in, the, in Matthew passage in the genealogy saying, so-and-so was the father of Joseph, which was the husband of Mary. It doesn't say it's Jesus' father. This goes to Joseph, the husband of Mary. The other passage goes to a different one of David's sons and ends up with Joseph. And you can study those too. Now, some have said, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. The genealogies are different. No, no, no. They're exactly correct. They're tracing it through the two different sons of David because Jesus not only had the legal right to sit on the throne, he had the priestly right to sit on the throne. Both his mother and his stepfather were royalty. Now, the fact is Israel didn't have their own king at the time because they'd been controlled by the Romans. But if they had had their own kingdom, Jesus would have been the rightful king through both his stepfather and his mother. So there are no contradictions in the genealogies there. Don't let anybody tell you that. But here we have the Bible telling us very clearly, Adam was the first man. Now, if you read through Genesis chapter 5, 
it goes through the genealogies. It says, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son. And we'll go later in the seminar explaining why they lived to be so old. But Adam lived 130 years and begat a son and called his name Seth. So, if you get a graph paper like I've done on, the, on my chart right here, you come over 130 years and you mark off a, a line and this is when Seth was born. Then it says Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Then it says Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. If, in your seminar notebook, the very last page folds out to be this chart. We just got the color ones in, but you got a black and white one in your notebook there. The last page will fold out to be this chart showing the genealogies, and you can trace through Genesis chapter 5. On that seminar notebook, in, on that chart in the seminar notebook, there are all sorts of interesting points to ponder. You really should take some time to read through the passages that are referred to here. Quite a few different passages are referred to of where you find the dates to tell the age of the earth. Because some of the places in the Bible, it gets a little confusing to follow. And then all of a sudden you find a New Testament verse that refers back and helps you clear up all the details. It'll say, for instance, that Israel was ruled by judges for 350 years. Oh, well, then that settles all the differences of the genealogies, you know. Sometimes when you get into the kings, you have overlapping reigns. King David is king for, you know, X number of years. King Solomon becomes king. They're both considered king at the same time. So their reigns overlap. And Oftentimes, there are New Testament passages that straighten out those details. And if you go through these verses that are listed on your chart here, in the seminar notebook uh, longevity chart, you should find enough information there to clear up uh, some of these tough spots. Now, there are a few differences between the genealogies as far as once in a while it will say, so-and-so was the son of David, when actually he's his great-great-great-great-grandson. That's common in the Hebrew uh, writing to do that, to say, you know, he's the son of David, when actually there's several generations in there. So there's a few places where you may find a generation skipped. In, uh, like in Luke, I think it has an extra person in there compared to Matthew. Uh, so the Bible warned us to be careful about endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in Christ, you know. So I think you may find a few passages that will confuse you. I went through this four or five different times as a young Christian, adding up the dates, reading through my Bible avidly, trying to find out how old is the earth exactly. I don't think you're going to get it exactly. For instance, it says, Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. Does that mean that's when Canaan was conceived or that's when Canaan was born? There would be a nine-month difference there, right? And was it exactly on Enos's 90th birthday or was it, is there a leeway in there of a year? So some of these guys try to get it exactly down to the day, you know, when the creation was. I don't think you're ever going to do that. There's just obvious problems with doing that. But the dates come out, <coughs> excuse me, to approximately 4,000 B.C., which would be 6,000 years ago. A lot of people get confused by this because we measure our time from Jesus Christ, from his birth. So it's been 2,000 years since the birth of Christ, and there were 4,000 years before that. So 4 plus 2 equals 6,000 years total of human history. And many people teach and believe, and they may be right, that God is working on a 6,000-year calendar where we're going to go 6,000 years of human history and then a 1,000-year reign of Christ, which means the Lord should come back any time. Now, we know our calendar is all mixed up. Because Jesus was not born in the year zero, there actually was no year zero. They didn't have a zero in their mathematics back then. They went from negative one to positive one. Makes it kind of confusing for bookkeeping, but that's what they did. Uh, <clears throat> actually, most scholars think Jesus was born either in 2 or 4 or 6 B.C. How can he be born four years before Christ? You know, he is Christ. Well, it's just because our calendar is screwed up, so we don't know the date. We also don't know that... Um, we should go with 365 and a quarter days or 360 days in the Hebrew calendar. There's a little leeway there. And see, people often say, do you think the Lord's coming back in the year 2000? Well, I hope so, but uh, God might not be using our calendar. You know, he may have his own. So I wouldn't sell my clothes and go stand on a mountain someplace. We don't know when the Lord's coming back. Okay, I would just keep serving the Lord until he comes. But the dates from the Bible, if you just simply add them up, and there's a few tough spots, I understand, 
but you're going to get approximately 6,000 years ago, not millions of years ago. And I think it'd be wise for you to read through those verses there on the longevity chart at the bottom and look them up yourself and say, okay, this does piece together some of the details. Uh, other passages uh, tie things in, especially in the New Testament. For instance, in the book of Jude, it says Enoch was, was it the seventh from Adam? I think is how the verse goes in the book of Jude. That says Noah, the eighth person. Oh, well, that closes the gaps right there, doesn't it? If Noah is the eighth person, well, at least you know there's no gaps between Adam and Noah. So there are there are passages, and it'd be wise to read those carefully and say, wow, hey, wait a minute, that does eliminate any speculation. There's a few other places, especially when you get up, you know, after the king, King David. King David was king about 1000 B.C. That's a good landmark to, to keep track here. Abraham lived about 2000 B.C. So you got Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and then King David. Now, before King David, of course, they had 400 years of slavery in uh, Egypt. Moses led them out about 1400 B.C. And then they had 350 years of judges. Then they had King Saul for 40 years, and then King David 40 years, and then King Solomon for 40 years. And after that, they got a whole bunch of kings. They split up into two kingdoms, and it gets kind of confusing to follow. And finally, they both get taken captive. One bunch goes in 721 B.C. to the Syrians, I believe, and the other bunch goes to Nebuchadnezzar about 120 years later, and they get taken captive. And they finally get back in the land, and then they're under Roman control when Jesus is born on the scene right there. Okay, long story. Anyway, about 6,000 years ago for the creation is what the Bible teaches. Now, you will find some, like the Schofield Reference Edition, uh, which says it was this happened in 4004 B.C. You're not going to get that close <laughs> from reading the Bible. But actually, it's interesting. Bishop Usher in 16, I don't know, 16 or 1700 did this. Went through the scriptures, spent a lifetime devoting his, himself to finding out the exact date of creation. And he analyzed everything he could find that might give a clue. You know, any eclipses that are mentioned uh, or things like that. You know, he went through all the, all the information he could find and come up with 4004 B.C. Uh, nobody's ever proven him wrong, let me say that, but I would not dogmatically say it was 4004 B.C. Now, atheists ask me all the time, since I do lots of debates at universities, they'll say, who did Adam's sons marry? You're going to get asked this question sooner or later. Uh, last night, I was preaching in Alabama, and two kids stayed afterwards. Becky, you were there. Two of these kids were strong believers in evolution, and they argued with me for well over an hour after the seminar. And one of the questions is, well, who did Adam's sons marry? You're going to get that invariably somebody will bring that question up. And they're asking the question, assuming you don't have an answer, and thinking, well, see, the Bible's wrong. That's what they're, of course, trying to do. And I'm convinced from doing this for 31 years now, being a Christian 31 years, many people want desperately to prove this book wrong because of their lifestyle. I told one of the kids last night, senior in high school, he said, I used to be a Christian, but I, I, I gave it up because evolution is true. We talked after an hour. I looked at him and I said, you know, I bet I know why you gave up on the Bible. <clears throat> it's not because you have any evidence for evolution, obviously, because I've been asking you for it for the last hour. I don't know you at all, but uh, I bet you gave it up because there's something in here that goes against your lifestyle. I don't know if it's pornography or... He said, why would you say that? First thing he said, <laughs> lucky guess, just hit it right on the head. <laughs> That's why people don't like that book. It chaps their hide. Well, get some Vaseline, man. You're going to need it because we're going to be judged according to that book, whether you like it or not. Who did they marry anyway? The Bible says in Genesis 4, Cain, after he slew Abel, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Well, that'll preach right there. The Bible says Jonah went down to Tarshish. Anytime you get away from the Lord, it's down. And he went down into the ship. Then he went down into the sea. Then he went down into the whale's belly. He kept going down, down, down until he hit rock bottom. And finally, the whale said, I can't stand this preacher. I'm going to get rid of him. And puked him up on, he went to a whale seminary and came out. He learned a little thing down there. He learned something down there. But it says, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. And on the east of Eden, and Cain knew his wife. 
Now, the word new is an old King James word for they had sexual intercourse and his wife conceived, it says. Now, it does not say he found her there. It says he knew her there. Some people say, see, he went to Nod and found his wife. That's not what it says, is it? It says he went to Nod and knew his wife. She brought her, he brought her with him. He had to marry one of his sisters. There's all sorts of reasons they had to marry sisters. People say, who did Cain marry? Where did Cain get a wife? Who did Seth marry? The Bible says Seth begat Enos. Okay, who was Seth's wife? Legitimate questions, but oftentimes you have to realize they're not asking the question in some cases because they want an answer. They're asking the question because they want an excuse to reject the Bible. And keep that thought in mind. I mention that to them very, you know, in debates all the time. Now, are you asking this question because you would really like an answer? Or because you're determined to reject God's word? And I say that to them right to their face. And I think we need to be a little bit confrontational in our Christianity. I get letters probably once a week. Martha could tell you, maybe it's more than that. <laughs> letters and phone calls saying, you know, I don't like something in your seminar because you're driving somebody off. I heard Jack Hiles say one time, uh, he said, uh, this guy came to him and said, I don't like the way you win souls. Jack Hiles said, well, how do you do it? He said, well, I don't do it. He said, well, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it, that's for sure. And I don't like everything I do either. I mean, I am a little confrontational in my debates and in my seminars. And I tell folks, man, if you don't like something in my seminar, edit it out. They're not copyrighted. I don't know why all Christians don't do that, but <laughs> they're not. And some people say, I, I, probably every one of my jokes that I tell has been criticized. I finally have a, a standard letter I send out. Thank you so much for your letter. I understand you don't like, you know, and I fill in the blank, whatever joke it was. <laughs> I say, I certainly will try to be sensitive to the Lord, and I'll delete anything in my seminar that God tells me to delete. In the meantime, until he tells me, feel free to edit it out and send the tapes to your friends. In other words, I'm listening to God as carefully as I know how <laughs> until he tells me I'm leaving it in, but you can't tell him like that way. But that's the way I do it, okay? I decided I'm going to please God, or try to. And if nobody else likes it, oh well. He's the one I'm more scared of than anybody. So I'll just, I'll just stick with uh, trying to please him. So who did they marry anyway? I'd say those folks who say, you know, who did Adam's sons marry? I start off by pointing out that this is a minor problem compared to what they believe. I think a good technique or good tactic to use in this would be to do what I'm about to do. They'll say, who did, who did Adam's sons marry? And I'll say, okay, we can talk about that. However, I would like you to keep fresh in your mind what you believe. 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang. This is what they teach. Last night, one of the boys was all upset. He said, it wasn't 20 billion years ago. It was only 16. <laughs> well, you're missing the point, okay? He said, there was a big bang. That's what the I'm just reading what the textbook says. And then they say, all the matter in the universe was squished into this little dot. They don't know where the dot came from, of course. And then it exploded. And the textbook says, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, which is what I have on my chart. And these same two, two charts are in your seminar notebook, the two timelines. Absolutely one of the most effective things to do to discuss evolution with somebody. I do this on the airplanes every week. I flew what, 10 flights last week. <laughs> it was a busy week. But uh, I will take my napkin out when I sit next to somebody on the airplane, and I draw two lines on there, and I make four marks on each line. Creation, flood, Jesus, today, the creation timeline. And Big Bang, Earth Forming, Life Starting, and Today. Because there's something about visualizing in front of you instead of just verbalizing and talking about it. When you see the visual, it's like, wow, it doesn't make sense, does it? So instead of just telling them what they believe, show them what they believe. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, Blessed is he that heareth, or he that readeth, and they that hear. See, you only gain... a 10 or 15 percent through what you hear. I get less than that. I got to see it. People give me directions. You know, oh, go down the street, turn left, go two blocks, turn right. I said, stop right there. I'm already lost. Write it down. Draw me a map. You draw me a map. I look at the map. Throw it away. I can drive right to it. You can tell me 50. Now, women seem to be better at listening to directions. And they don't understand how men can't do it. So they get mad at the husband and say, you never listen to me. <laughs> I'm trying, but it just doesn't register. <laughs> Draw me a map, okay? Make me a list. They just learn different, if at all. Uh, 
So I put the four points on the map, and this clarifies it. So when somebody says, "Who did who did you know Cain or Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve's sons marry?" I say, "Okay, let's we'll talk about that in a minute." However, I want you to see the problem you have. You're teaching that 20 billion years ago there was a big bang. You don't know what exploded. 4.6 billion years ago the Earth cooled down, developed a hard rocky crust. This is what the book says. 3.9 billion years ago, the Earth had cooled enough for water vapor to condense, and the Earth was, for the first time, experiencing violent rainstorms. That's what the textbook says. And in the oceans, the first living organisms appeared. Now, you see this in textbooks a lot, and I've got a giant textbook collection in my office. You can go in and see it later if you'd like. They will say, these life forms appeared, or they emerged. That's not a scientific explanation. That's a religious statement. That's no different than us saying, in the beginning, God, is it? They say, oh, these living organisms appeared. This one says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> well, I guess it is. <laughs> Doesn't happen at all. How can they say this kind of stuff and call it science? Has anybody ever seen soup come alive? No, that's not a that has no business being in a science book. That's not a scientific statement. That's a religious statement. This is a college textbook. I've got it in my office there. It says the first self -replica self replicating systems, in other words, organisms able to reproduce, must have emerged in this organic soup. One of the first debates, I, matter of fact, the first debate I ever did, University of West Florida. One of the guys in the audience asked Dr. Pruitt, who's the anthropology professor there. They said, Dr. Pruitt, would you please explain to us how sexual reproduction evolved? I mean, you go from animals that just simply divide, you know, asexual reproduction. How do you get male and female? He stood up and he said, well, going from asexual to sexual reproduction is a giant mother may I step in the process of evolution. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait a minute. A mother may I step. You ever play that game, mother may I, you know, the guy turns around, <laughs> mother may I. Yes, you may. A mother, may I step? That's not a scientific explanation. That's an, that shows an enormous amount of faith. And I don't care if they want to believe that. I tell them, look, I don't, if you want to believe in evolution, that doesn't bother me. You can believe in the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, evolution. doesn't bother me. But if you want to use my tax dollars to teach all the kids in public school that that's science, oh, now that's going to bother me. Because <laughs> that's not science. That's your religious belief. But here they say they must have emerged. There's that word again. Now watch for that. You see it all through the textbooks. Man emerged in the African continent three million years ago. Just claiming that they emerged, does that, does that mean anything? That's not science. How they don't see it, I don't know. All I can figure out is the God of this world has blinded their minds. They didn't emerge. So I tell them, look, fellas, you believe 4.6 billion years ago the earth formed, or 4.6 billion years ago earth formed, and then it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. Or 3.9, according to some books. Who cares? Okay. Some are saying 4.1 now. They're missing the whole point. So I don't have a date on this one. Because you look at 10 books, you're going to get 10 different numbers. But the bottom line is they have to believe in spontaneous generation which was proven wrong 150 years ago. Many years, 150 years ago, there were recipes in some of the books how to make mice. Put rats and old food, I mean, I'm sorry, put rags and old food in a ball, old rags and some old food in a ball and throw it in the corner and leave it for three weeks and it will turn into mice. Well, duh. <laughs> And so a guy named Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur both did experiments to prove that life only comes from living material. That'd be two scientists you ought to know the names of. Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur, where we get our pasteurization of milk. Pasteurized. doesn't mean this high. It means he's a French guy. Okay, Not pasteurized, but pasteurized. Uh, Louis, uh, Louis Pasteur and Francisco Reddy, just Reddy and Pasteur would be good enough for me on a quiz, two people who proved spontaneous generation is wrong. Now, the word generation comes from the word where we get the word for genes. 
to be regenerated. The Bible talks about being regeneration. To be regenerated is when you get born again, when you accept Christ as your Savior. You are re-gened. You get a new gene code. You're a new person. Regenerated. That'll preach right there. So, the evolutionists believe that this first life form, whatever it was, 3.9 billion years ago, found somebody to marry. Now, just hold on a second. Going from non-living material to living material is a giant step. And then going from something that's alive to something that's able to reproduce is a, another gigantic step. Those are just brushed over in the textbooks as if, well, it must have happened because here we are. I asked an evolutionist in a debate, can you please explain how do we get from just living organisms to sexual reproduction in living organisms? And he said, well, it's a much more efficient system because it mixes the genes of the mother and the father. Well, because it's a better system doesn't explain how it got here, does it? That's not an explanation. And if you read the critics on the website that criticize me, their answers are hilarious. Somehow they think, because I talked, I answered the question. I had students like that when I was in school. You ask them an essay question, they could write six pages and not say a word. How many of you have done that to your teacher, yourself, okay? When you don't know the answer, you blitz them with a lot of words, right? <laughs> Eric, you did that a few times, I'm sure, right? Been there, done that. <laughs> Read through the scoffers' letters and their answers, and it's just like, they're just blowing. They're not answering. They're just saying to hear themselves, they're just talking to hear themselves talk. And it's hilarious. So when somebody says, who did, where did Cain get a wife, and who did Seth marry? I first point out the folly of what they believe. And now, the problem I have looks very small. Let's put it in perspective. Compared to your problem, everything came from a rock. And that's an expression that drives them nuts. I use that all the time. I asked the guy last week, last debate I was in, in uh, wherever it was, a couple weeks ago, I said, <clears throat> would you please just answer a question for me? Do you believe we came from a rock? He talked for five or ten minutes, did not answer the question. I said, well, thank you for all that stuff you said, but uh, would you please answer my question now? Do you? I just want a yes or no. Do you believe we came from a rock? He went off and talked for 10 or 15 more minutes, you know. I said, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. Now, let's go back to the question. Do you believe we came from a rock? Finally, he said, yes, I do. <laughs> that's all I want to know. <laughs> Why did it take you 20 minutes to tell me that? <laughs> just admit it. If you believe we came from a rock, that's fine. Be proud of it. You know, put a rock in a picture frame. Great, 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 grandpa. Family tree. Make a slide. Yes, there's great, 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 great grandpa. The Bible teaches, and we'll take a break after this. Adam lived after he begat Seth 800 years and begat sons and daughters. Now tell me, how many kids could you have in 800 years? Several, right? So, in the first generation, they married sisters. Here's my reasons I give, and you might want to learn these reasons. This would be a good quiz question, too. This, this stops them every time. They had to marry sisters. In the first place, there's no other choice. I mean, isn't that an obvious answer? There's, no, there's no, nobody else available. Secondly, who would you report them to? You're going to turn them into the police? Well, the policeman married his sister, too. I mean, that's all there is. You know? <laughs> Nobody would have thought anything about it, would they? It's just it's normal. Today, of course, you know, the idea of marrying sisters, oh, wow, it's horrible, it's terrible. Well, somebody's going to marry your sister, and they're going to think it's great. <laughs> you probably married somebody's sister, right? <laughs> so... There's no other choice. They would not have thought it's wrong. That could be actually two answers. You wouldn't have anybody to report them to. Thirdly, there were no, there were no laws against it. Atheists get all upset and say, well, that's incest and that's against the law. Well, now, wait a minute. When was that law given? Moses gave the law right here, 1500 B.C., roughly, when Moses lived. That's well after the creation. 
Now, there's a, in almost every country, they have a, uh, a legal concept. Uh, we call it ex post facto here in America. You cannot pass a law and then fine somebody for breaking the law before it was passed. Let's suppose you're out spitting on the sidewalk and somebody says, we ought to make a law about that. Okay, so they pass the law. You can't spit on the sidewalk. Then they come arrest you because you did it last week. Ex post facto. It's a Latin for something. I don't know what it is, but it means after the fact. You can't pass a law and find somebody for something they did before the law was in effect. And that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to say, see, it's against the law to marry sisters. Cain married his sister, therefore he broke the law. Well, you numb skull. <laughs> Think about it, okay? There weren't any laws against it. See, <clears throat> they didn't need any laws against it. When the race was pure, there were no defective genes, no defective chromosomes. You would not have any deformed children. Everything about you is inherited. Even having children is hereditary. If your parents don't have any, you won't either. <laughs> That's been proven in laboratory tests, folks. <laughs> So, there's not a problem at all. See, the average human being, you have 46 chromosomes, and a chromosome, if you took a ladder about from here to Chicago, that'd be a long ladder, and you twisted it up, just start twisting in, make it like a corkscrew. Each of the rungs of the ladder is called a gene. The entire ladder is called a chromosome. It's called the double helix, and it gets pretty complicated in biology, but basically, you got this long ladder that's twisted up, Each of the rungs of the ladder is a gene. You can look up chromosome in any biology textbook and it'll show you one of these pictures. Each of these genes does different things. You've probably got a whole section right here of the gene code that's going to determine what color hair you have. It's like the code in a computer. It's a computer code, okay? Now, when you get married, you and the husband or wife are going to each contribute half of a chromosome to the baby. It is absolutely beyond comprehension that you can get a ladder from here to Chicago that's twisted. It breaks in half all the way down the middle, unwinds itself, finds the one coming from the husband or wife, and winds itself back together. Forty-six of them. Incredible. There isn't anybody on the planet who has a clue how this can happen. When this ladder gets back together, suppose you have contributed genetic information for blonde hair. Your wife has contributed a section of genetic information for red hair. One of those is going to be dominant, and the kid's going to be born with whichever is the most dominant. And you get into Mendel's laws of you know dominant genes and recessive genes and all that kind of stuff. But there is a... Scientists estimate that probably of the billions of genes you have, about 3,500 of them are defective. you got about 3,500 defective genes in your gene pool. And 3,500 out of billions is insignificant. Okay, It's a 0.00001% or something like that. It's a very small number. But if you marry somebody who's very closely related to you, like a first cousin or a niece or your aunt there is a good chance that the same defective genes exist in her that exist in you, and so you probably will have something deformed on the child. Which is why, in almost every state, it is against the law to marry closer than a first cousin. I believe three states still allow first cousin marriages. Almost all states, it has to be at least a second cousin or farther distant related, because you're going to probably end up with something deformed either low IQ. Now, what happened in, uh, in Europe years ago, they had to marry royalty. Well, sometimes the only royalty available is your sister. And since they want to pass on the royal line, they would marry their sister or their aunt or their niece or their first cousin. And they ended up with some strange things. Six fingers was very common. One of the queens, I think it was the queen of Europe or I mean England or something, had special dresses designed with a V coming down to cover her hand because she had six fingers and was embarrassed by it. All of her dresses had long sleeves with a V coming down. Some of the kings died of hemophilia. Hemophiliacs, they bleed to death. You cut them a little bit and they bleed. You bruise them and they bleed internally. Bleed to death. 
That's hemophilia. That's oftentimes from inbreeding. We had a little girl that rode our bus in, Michigan, in uh, Illinois when I drove a bus up there at a church bus. Her mother and her father were brother and sister. Nine-year-old boy raped his eight-year-old sister, and she got pregnant. The child rode the bus, came to our church, got saved. Sweet little girl. But she died when she was 12 or 13 years old of sickle cell anemia. She, had, she was sick most of her life and finally died at age 13. Close marriages like that often end in disaster today. But that would not be the case when the race was pure. So it's not a problem at all, actually for several generations. Even today, in the animal world, frequently cats will breed back to somebody in their own family. And sometimes you see cats that are six toes or seven toes. You ever seen those before? Or a little bit schizo? Yeah. All cats are schizo, in my opinion, but some are more than others, you know. And uh, that's oftentimes from inbreeding. Same thing with dogs. When they try to get a hybrid dog, you know, they keep breeding close to the bloodline to get a purebred chihuahua or something. Man, they're goofy. You know, they're just, they're, they're nervous. They're, they're jittery. Something's wrong with them, you know. <laughs> Little loco a la cabeza. Uh, crazy. That's from the close inbreeding, and that would not be a problem here, but it is a problem today. Okay, let's give a fourth reason why it's not a problem to marry sisters. Adam married his rib. Didn't he? People say, you can't marry sisters because of genetic similarity. I say, Adam married his rib. It's not a problem at all in the first generation. They would have had identical gene pool. Now, some have argued, well, how do you get the four different blood types? You know, A, B, AB, and type O. There's a great article in Creation Magazine about that, the four different blood types and how they could have easily arisen from Adam and Eve. Now, if you want to go get Creation Magazine uh, in uh, Answers in Genesis dot org is the website, or you can get it, or you can call 800-350-3232 uh, and get Creation Magazine. It only comes out four times a year, and it's like $22 a year, <clears throat> so it's you know five and a half bucks an issue, but it's just an awesome magazine to get and uh, devour on the creation subject. There's a few things I argue with them about. You know, I disagree with them on a couple things, and I've tried to tell them that they don't want to hear my opinion for some reason, <laughs> but uh, I still recommend them anyway. It's a good magazine. So there's not a problem marrying sisters in the first generation. There are some things you will not notice reading your Bible. <clears throat> I read the Bible, I don't know how many times, 60 or 80 times from now, but some things you don't notice until you graph it out, like I've done in this chart, this longevity chart. When you graph it out, all of a sudden you say, wow, I never saw that before. For instance, you will not notice until you graph it out that Adam lived long enough to know Lamech. Noah's father knew Adam for 56 years. Look at the seminar notebook graph there, or the same thing here. But if you look in your book, it's just amazing when all of a sudden you realize how many generations back did Noah actually have an opportunity to meet? How many of you met your grandparents? How many of you have actually met your great-grandparents? Has anybody ever actually met your great-great-grandparents? Nobody in the room. Look at Noah. He could have known Methuselah, his grandfather. He couldn't have known Enoch because he he left early, okay? But then that, then he could have known Jared. That would be his that would be his great great grandfather. That's two generations. He could have known Mahaliel. That's his great 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 grandfather. Canaan and Enos. He would have missed Seth, but he could have known his great 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 grandfather. I bet they could have told a few stories, you know. Can you imagine Adam being able to tell his kids and grandkids and great-grandkids what it was like in the Garden of Eden? Imagine a family reunion back in those days. Okay, everybody hop on the camel. We're going to go visit great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather Adam. And he's going to tell us what it was like in the Garden of Eden before the first woman ate the first man out of house and home or whatever happened back then. But she did eat, and they were kicked out. Uh, <clears throat> Some people say, did Adam ever have a date with Eve? Well, most people think it might have been an apple. but uh, The dates in the Bible add up to 6,000, and you don't catch some things until you graph it out. For instance, 
Some people are getting these things and using them for placemats at their table when they have company over. That'll start a conversation. We have them in laminated form, uh, real heavy 10 mil lamination, <laughs> expensive stuff, like a driver's license. But they're five bucks a piece for the colored ones, and you can get them in laminated for placemats or something. Or just hang on. Some people mount them on their wall and posters and frames and stuff like a picture. It really stirs a conversation. Like, wow, what is that? Some people try to teach that the Bible was handed down generation after generation after generation. You ever heard that before? Look at your chart. Is it possible that Adam knew Methuselah? Take a look at your chart. By several hundred years, right? Is it possible that Methuselah knew Shem, his great-grandson? They could have known each other for 100 years, right? Look how far Shem lived after the flood. Shem could have known Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So here you got Adam telling the story firsthand to Methuselah. Methuselah telling it to Shem. And Shem telling it to Abraham and Isaac. And if anybody argues or questions their story, you go back and check with the source. He's still alive. <laughs> I don't believe you. Oh, let's go meet him. Come on. Let's go get in the car. Let's, I'll take you right now. It's also interesting, if you read through the book of Genesis, if you get the Defender's Bible, Henry Morris's uh, Defender's Bible is just awesome. We sell it to our ministry. You can get it through ICR. In Genesis chapter 2, he's got an amazing note, footnote down here. Eric, I don't know if you have a chance to read that yet, about the ten different teledotes. Oh, it'll, it's like, wow. About 150 years ago, some German higher critics began to criticize the Bible because they noticed as they read through Genesis, it appeared like there were four different authors. And so they had the J-E-D-P, I think is the initials for it, the, the Yahwist, the uh, Priestly. And they said there's actually four different people that wrote the book of Genesis, and, you know, it comes from four different sources, and it's just a compilation of, you know, myths. Well, they blew it. There's actually ten different authors to the book of Genesis. No place in the Bible does it say Moses wrote Genesis. Moses was the editor of Genesis. Moses wrote the next four books. He wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But Moses did not write Genesis. He edited it. What happened? God wrote part of Genesis and apparently gave it to Adam. Adam wrote part and passed it on. Noah took some of the book of Genesis on the ark with him. Noah wrote some. There's a phrase you look for as you read through Genesis. It says, these are the generations of. That is their signature. I'm signing off. I'm handing it to somebody else now. Let me show it to you here. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 4. These are the generations of. That phrase appears in Genesis 2, 4. It appears in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1, chapter 6, verse 9, chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 10. Too fast? Chapter 11, verse 27. Chapter 25, verse 19. Chapter 36, verses 1 and 9. And chapter 37, verse 2. What's happening here is they're passing on the baton. They're signing off saying, these are the generations of Adam. Then somebody else takes over writing. So to scoffers that are saying Genesis is written by four different authors, no, it's written by ten different authors. But all of them were eyewitnesses. This wasn't a story passed down generation after generation. This is eyewitness accounts. And it's just an amazing footnote there that Henry Morris has, and it's probably on their website, uh, ICR, which stands for Institute for Creation Research, icr.org. If not, uh, I'd recommend you get the Defender's Study Bible. It's just tremendous. We have them in leather, Dan. Did we ever get those in? Just burgundy only in the leather. Otherwise, you can get them in hardback, and they're like 50 bucks, aren't they? 35 for the hardback. 35 for hardback and 50 for the leather. But they're, they're, that's awesome footnotes there. You may want to read that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, his explanation of the ten different... It's called a teledoth. I closed it because I don't know how to spell it, uh, or else I'll tell you right now. T-E-L-A-doth. Uh, but the Bible was not handed down generation after generation. Now, you need to be aware that there is a little controversy on one date on this chart. And it's spelled out. If you look in the uh, notes on your timeline, 
I think it is note number... It's about when was Abraham born? Which note or talks? Well, let's see. Um, oh, look at note number 13. All ten of Abraham's post flood ancestors, even Noah, were alive for his early life. There is a discrepancy about Terah's age at the birth of Abram. I have marked on my chart that Terah was 70 when Abram was born. You see that on there? There is an interesting note in one of Henry Morris's books, and it's listed there. Which is the name of the book? I forgot to... Uh, no, the Genesis Record, where he explains about this controversy about how old was Terah at Abram's birth. Terah might have been 130 when Abram was born. Either 70 or 130 is a 60-year discrepancy in there. Okay, about Abram's birth. So you just need to be aware. I'd recommend you get the book noted there and read that passage if you want to know. Because some people may nail you on that and you need to be aware. You say, oh yeah, I've heard about that controversy. I read all the stuff and decided to go with the 70. Though I'm aware that it really could be 130. That's about the only date I'm aware of where there's a real discrepancy in the genealogy. And it'd be worth reading to note just so you can say, yes, I've read that. I know about it. Okay. Shem, though, lived long enough certainly to know Abraham and Isaac and possibly Jacob, depending upon which date you put for Abram's birth. It may slide the scale over 60 years if you use the 130 for Terah's age when Abram was born. And it goes into all the genealogy stuff. It gets a little complicated, but it's interesting to study. Shem was? They could have gone anywhere. These people could have gone anywhere. They had the whole world. Shem and these guys. Um, they were allowed to go anywhere. Now, later, later, Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, which is over in Babylon, uh, Baghdad, basically, uh, to come over there. But nobody knows where Shem lived or Noah. How long did Noah live after the flood? Where did he live? What did he do? Right, against God's judgment. <laughs> right. Well, Shem might have already been there. Maybe that's where Shem lived. When Abraham went to Israel, he met a guy named Melchizedek, the Ancient of Days, without father or mother. Well, since everybody else probably still had their father and mother still alive, to meet somebody who didn't, some people think Noah or Shem was Melchizedek. I wouldn't be dogmatic about it, but that is a very interesting theory and certainly a possibility. And Melchizedek lived in Jerusalem. At the time, it wasn't a city. All right, while we're on the subject of what did Noah and Shem do after the flood, I mean, they did live a long time. You got to keep in mind, they're living on a devastated planet. Everything is destroyed. It's like Gilligan's Island. You got nothing to work with. So probably just survival was a full-time job for just about everybody. Kind of like the pioneers, Daniel Boone and those guys, you know. You work 16 hours a day just to get food on the table. That would certainly be the case for the first 100 years after the flood, maybe. I don't know. But it was, I'm sure it was a difficult life for a while. But in Numbers chapter 6, it says, They shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them, God said. In 1 Kings chapter 9, the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there. God says, I'm going to put my name right there. 2 Kings chapter 21. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. Stay with me here now. 2 Kings chapter 21. In Jerusalem, which I have chosen of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Second Chronicles 33. In Jerusalem, will I put my name forever. You say, who cares? Well, watch this now. 
If you look in Psalms chapter 119 in your Bible, you may have a Bible that tells the Hebrew alphabet. I think there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The letter Shin, S-C-H-I-N, with those, is this is the Hebrew letter that is the single letter that represents God. If they want to say God's name in one letter, they write this Shin. You follow this now? Notice the shape of the Shin. It's three lines coming up kind of at an angle. Notice the valleys in Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem with the valleys is laid out in a shin. Go to any Hebrew temple, go to any Jewish house. Almost all of them on their doorway someplace will have a little shin. That's God's name. And God said, I will put my name in Jerusalem. <laughs> it's right there. A pastor friend of mine from Milton showed me this. He said he was in Israel taking a tour with a secular tour group. He'd been on the Christian tour groups a couple of times. He decided to go with the secular group. And this Jewish guide is showing him around. And the Jewish guide knew he, knew he was a pastor. And said, well, pastor, do you have anything else to add to our tour here? He said, sure, put the map of Jerusalem back up there, would you please? He said, you see this valley right here, and this valley right here, and this valley right here? And the guide said, oh, it's a shin. <laughs> He'd lived there all of his life and never saw it. So some people think Noah, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> some people think Noah and or Shem, not Shem, Shem lived in what today is Jerusalem. If one of those guys was Melchizedek, that certainly would be a good type of Christ. Uh, Noah would certainly be interesting, you know, having lived through the flood. Now, I don't get dogmatic and I don't preach it that it's a fact, but it's just an interesting sidelight since we're chasing all the rabbits on this uh, course, that's something fascinating to study. God did put his name in Jerusalem. Later on, a fellow named Abraham went to sacrifice his son. He took his boy in the wood and climbed up a mountain. Guess which mountain? Right in Jerusalem. Later on, Jesus was crucified. Same mountain. Right in Jerusalem. All this happens in the same place. And it could be that that's where Noah and Shem went and lived. Now, some people think that Noah and Shem built the Great Pyramid. I don't know that that's true, but that's an interesting thought. Somebody certainly built the Great Pyramid. It's a strange one compared to the other pyramids, and I think it's worthy of study. Uh, one guy, Hank Hanegraaff, gets all upset with me because I mentioned pyramidology. <laughs> he's bla he never has called me, but he's blasted me several times on his radio program, The Bible Answer Man. And I tell everybody, well, tell him to call me. I can defend my position. In my seminar, I say... Here's what some people think, that the Great Pyramid might be, a, you know, a structure, a temple to the Lord. You know, it's got all kinds of Christian symbolism in there. Some people think it's just a heathen symbol. Some people think it's one of the star group, you know, from uh, Orion, I believe it is. I don't know. I just think if you're going to be a student of any subject, you ought to look at all the sides of it. So I just say, hey, here's what some people think about the Pyramid, the Great Pyramid. So it could be, indeed, a uh, the temple to the Lord or a witness to the Lord in the land of Egypt. Don't know. But Shem and Noah certainly did something. I think, if nothing else, they took incredible wisdom and knowledge that had been gained in the 1,600 years before the flood, and they tried to pass it on to the next generation. Now, today, there are all sorts of um, Masonic lodges type things, you know, who think they have the wisdom of the ancients. You've got to be really careful about going down that road because that's certainly... The average Mason doesn't know what he's in until he gets up to the top and finds out he's been in a satanic organization all of his life. They won't know that, and it's hard to tell them that because they get mad at you, but read the book by Sean Beam, or I will get into that in video number uh, five. All right. Uh, Shem lived long enough to know Abraham, Isaac, and possibly Jacob, depending on where you put Terah's age at Abraham's birth. Interesting verse in the Bible... Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, Jacob got married and then got married again and got married again, and his four wives had a contest as who could have the most kids. You know the story when you read through Genesis. He ended up with 13 kids. One girl, 12 boys. They became known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Those boys got mad at their brother and sold him into slavery. Which brother was that? Joseph, right. Sold him to be a slave. Joseph goes down to Egypt, ends up getting in trouble. You know, he's trying to be nice, but they end up throwing him in jail for Potiphar's wife who tries to seduce him. And an interesting story there. He just does what's right and ends up in jail for 17 years. 
He rises to the top and becomes the jailer's assistant, even though he's got to stay in jail. He's, you know, the jailer gives him run of the jail. And he interprets the dreams and all this kind of stuff. Bottom line is, eventually, Joseph becomes vice Pharaoh, or whatever they call him, okay? And so he becomes the assistant to Pharaoh. And Jacob, I mean, Joseph, sends his brothers back to get dad. Remember the story there? They all come down in the wagons and they move into the land of Goshen in Egypt. End up, they get stuck there for 400 and some years, as made slaves out of later, when there got to be about 2 million of them, and Moses leads them out 400 years later. Um, but Jacob is being introduced to Pharaoh. Here's Joseph introducing his dad. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, in Genesis 47, very interesting passage, Jacob, Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are in 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. Now let's stop right there. Remember, Jacob is the one that tricked his own brother out of his birthright. He tricked his brother a couple times, didn't he? Later on, Jacob got tricked. They said, oh, here's Joseph Coat. He's dead. The trickster got tricked. I think there's a verse in the Bible about something like that. Uh, Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. Right? And boy, Jacob sure did. And he said, I've lived 130 years and they've been few and evil. And a person that lives a wicked lifestyle, his life is it's hard. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. People that don't live for God have a hard life. Their conscience bothers them. Oh, looking over their shoulders, see if somebody's going to catch up with them for something. <laughs> Man, it's great living for God. You don't have to worry about what other people think. You don't have to worry about getting caught because you're trying to do what's right. But then he said, the days of the years of my life have been, and he said, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers. Why would he add a phrase like that? Pharaoh, I'm 130. I've had a rough life. However, I'm not near as old as my father's. Now, let's go back and look at the chart. Jacob, the guy who said this to Pharaoh, could have known Shem, our fact said, Selah, and Eber. How'd you like to meet somebody 460 years old? Interesting thought here. I have to quit in a few minutes, but... Uh, as a person gets older, the bones in the forehead get thicker. They get thick-headed. Some people do it when they're young, but it really happens when, when a person passes 100, strange things begin to happen to their physiology. For instance, as a person grows older, if they're still producing a certain hormone from the pituitary gland, I believe it is, their ears start to get longer. You ever seen old people that got real long ears? Or the nose gets wider. The disease is called acromegaly, excess secretion of hormones in old age. But there's a great book called Buried Alive, which deals with uh, the so-called cavemen. We'll get into more of that later. But he goes through how that some of the skeletons they're finding with the bigger eyebrow ridges are just people who are living past 100. That's all. They're not. Neanderthals weren't primitive. They're the same size as us, brain bigger than ours, just got bigger eyebrow ridges. And so they interpret this as evidence for evolution, when actually it's probably evidence they were living longer. Well, if you've got a whole generation of people that are living to be 400 years old, I mean, this went on for several generations, didn't it? Maybe what they're finding are the skeletons of these folks that are post-flood. They probably buried them somewhere, don't you think? Where are they? Well, I don't know, but it's just a thought that maybe some of the, <coughs> some of the Neanderthals are actually post-flood. Textbooks say the earth is billions of years old. The Bible teaches pretty clearly, Jesus said, the creation of Adam was the beginning. Now, there's an obvious conflict between what the two teach. So we have to come to the question, either Jesus knew what he was talking about, or he was lying, or he was just ignorant. He just didn't understand science. And very frequently, if you watch the debates I get in at universities, they will try very subtly to say, they'll say things like, well, you know, the average person just doesn't understand how complex evolution is. And I get up and I say, folks, what he's trying to say is, you're too dumb to understand and he's smart. And that's exactly what they do. Eric, you run into this all the time. Do you point that out to him? What you're saying, sir, is you're smart and we're all too dumb, right? Boy, they don't like it put that simply, but that's exactly what they're implying. 
and watch for that. You'll see it over and over and over when you get in discussions on creation and evolution. They try in all sorts of subtle ways to say, well, you know, science is pretty complex and the average layman doesn't understand it. Yeah, okay, here we go again. You're smart, we're dumb. <laughs> That's exactly what they're trying to imply. So, Jesus claimed to be God. I like Josh McDowell's thing on this. He says, well, since Jesus claimed to be God, we got three choices. He's either the Lord, or he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. Because if somebody claims to be God, he either is or he isn't. If he isn't, he's either crazy or he's lying. If I claimed to be Napoleon reincarnated, you would know either I am or I'm not, right? Now, if I'm not, then I'm, I'm loony. Heard about the guy that went to the mental institution, you know? And this guy is standing there with his arm in his coat, his hand in his coat, and somebody said, who are you? He said, I'm Napoleon. He said, oh yeah? Who told you you're Napoleon? He said, God did. The guy down the hall yelled out, I did not! <laughs> so, Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning, folks. Now we got a problem here. Was he lying? Or did he not understand? There are some Christians going around trying to teach the earth is billions of years old and we can fit it in fine with the Bible. Well, they're calling Jesus either dumb or a liar. Matthew 19.4 is an important verse, folks. You just can't get around it. He said that was the beginning. Textbooks say the earth is billions of years old. Isn't it all through the textbooks? Billions of years ago, millions of years ago, 4.6 billion years ago this happened. Do you think this stuff is taught in our county right here? Do you realize there's over 150 churches in Escambia County, Florida? I've heard that the next county, Santa Rosa, is in list, listed in Guinness Book of World Records as having the most churches per capita in the world. I don't know that that's true, but I believe it is. Certainly a lot of churches over there, right? This is the Bible Belt, right? Why, in the middle of the Bible Belt, with all these Christians, do we have textbooks teaching something that call Jesus a liar? When I first moved to town, I went down and talked to Katie Knight, who was at that time in charge of the science curriculum in Scambia County. I wrote letters. I tried to be nice. I went and visited her twice. I said, Katie, uh, why are we teaching this evolution in the textbooks? Look what you have in this book. This says blah, blah, blah. This has been proven wrong 100 years ago. Get that out of the books. She said, Mr. Hoven, you are the only person in the county complaining about evolution in the textbooks. I thought, where is everybody? Isn't our job to be the salt of the earth? Doesn't salt preserve? What salt does when it finds a bacteria, it sucks all the water out of it and kills it. That's our job. Salt irritates. If nobody's irritated at you, you're probably not a very good Christian. Now, you don't have to try to irritate people. You just try to be salty. That will irritate them. <laughs> I just trying to be salty, that's all. My job is to preserve. And if that means we got kids going to go to school tomorrow morning and be poisoned, I should try to stop that. Right? I just take it kind of personal. And if you think I leave my gorgeous wife because I like being gone from home, you're mistaken. I, I think part of my job is to be the salt of the earth, and the textbooks are destroying this next generation of kids' minds, and it starts with propaganda like this, saying billions of years ago. Once you believe the billions of years ago part, the rest kind of comes, well, maybe it happened. Ask an evolutionist. How do you think a dog could come from something that is non-dog? And they'll say, given enough time, that's always the way their sentence starts. Well, given enough time, stop right there, that's all I need to hear. We got a whole section in the notebook about that, about the age of the earth, back on page uh, 10, 11, 12, whatever it is. Their solution is always time, page 9 in this edition. They'll say, well, give it enough time. Folks, there's not enough time. The earth is not billions of years old. There are some Christians going around teaching the earth is billions of years old. I have, right here in front of me, a couple of the books by Dr. Hugh Ross. Creation and Time. This one is two books put together, Creation and Time, and Creator in the Cosmos and Creation and Time. This book incorporated in here. I debated Hugh Ross on the radio. It was an hour-long program, but with commercials, we only got 30 minutes of talk time in. And we're supposed to have another debate on the John Ankerberg Show. 
I went and visited and toured Hugh Ross's ministry a few weeks ago when I was in California. Hugh Ross is one of the most vocal spokesmen for the old earth creationists, they're called. Those who say, yes, God made the world, however, he used the Big Bang, and the earth is billions of years old. Now, Hugh Ross is a very nice guy. Everybody that's written to me or called me says, oh, he's such a nice man. I used to go to church with him. Oh, and he's such a wonderful man. Now, I don't know. <clears throat> I've only talked to him on the phone. I've never met him. He was in a meeting when I was out there touring his ministry a couple weeks ago, but he may be the nicest guy in the world. Does that have anything to do with what he believes? Aren't some of the Mormons really nice people? Yeah. Aren't some Jehovah's Witness really nice people? Sure, no question. Does that have anything to do with them being right or wrong? No. And you've got to be careful you don't fall into that trap of thinking, because they're such a nice guy, such a humble person, therefore they must be right. <laughs> Hold it. That's got nothing to do with right or wrong. I bet some of the prophets of Baal were nice guys. They probably took their kids for rides on the camel. Probably fixed their wife breakfast in the morning when she didn't feel good. But they're pagan, right? And if you want to get into what Hugh Ross really believes, it's very difficult reading his book. I was in the debate with him on the radio, and I said, Dr. Ross, do you believe it was a global flood in the days of Noah? He said, I believe the Bible, and I believe it was a universal flood. I said, what do you mean by that, Dr. Ross? He said, well, it flooded Noah's little universe. It's a matter of playing on words. This book, which we sell at our ministry, Creation and Time, goes through everything he really believes and exposes it. Now, he, he may be a really nice guy. He's certainly a very smart man. I've seen him on several TV programs, and he's been on uh, Trinity Broadcasting a bunch of times, and he's their you know, poster boy for, for, evolu or for, for theistic evolution, sort of. You know, I w He doesn't claim to believe in theistic evolution, but he really he, he learned all of his science first, being an astronomer, uh, in Toronto, I believe, or Canada someplace, in th uh, astronomy training. And then he began to read the Bible and try to blend the two together. But in his mind, what the scientists are teaching today can't be changed. We have to make the Bible fit this. He believes it was a local flood in the days of Noah. This book exposes all that. But when you get people who claim to be Christians that are going around saying the earth is billions of years old, there's going to be a division. The Southern Baptist Church today is split down over between the liberals and the conservatives over basically one question. Is the Bible the Word of God? And the reason they're fighting over that question is primarily over one other question. How old is the earth? If the earth is only 6,000 years old, like this book clearly teaches, well, then evolution can't be true. Not enough time. Even if there is billions of years, it still doesn't. We don't see dogs produce non-dogs. But the first obstacle the evolutionist has to overcome, he has to have billions of years. And when you get Christians going around teaching the earth is billions of years old, this is the beginning of the problem. We'll get into later in seminar part four about how in the 1800s some Christians started teaching the earth is billions of years old when they developed the geologic column. The scientists stood up against Darwin. It was the pastors that supported Darwin in 1859 when his book came out. We'll get into more of that later. Next week, we'll talk more about different scientific ways to show the earth cannot possibly be billions of years old. It just can't be. And I think this is crucial because if you nail it down, the earth is young, it's not billions of years old, then the argument's over. It's over. You win it in the first round. All right? See you next week.